A common critique of the modern left is that we're hypocrites. Whether it's Bernie Sanders flying first class, or a random Twitter user with a little Twitter for iPhone showing at the bottom of their tweets, gesturing at imagined hypocrisy is a staple of anti-socialist rhetoric. Now, I could of course point out that even if you were to find genuine hypocrisy in your political opponent, that isn't of itself an argument. If I were to say that it's wrong to stab people before stabbing you, that wouldn't invalidate my original claim. But for the sake of argument, let's entertain the idea. Let's examine the case of the Champagne Socialist. Oh, good evening, my fellow workers. La Dame de la Terre. Isn't the world unfair? Just this year, billionaires made $360 billion. The thing, I almost lost my job. And not to speak of the horrible exploitation in the third world countries. I watched a documentary on it recently. It's just terrible, isn't it? I say we need some serious reform. Nay, revolution. Yes, viva la revolution. With the rise of progressivism comes the rise of reactionaries. Since 2013 with Gamergate, online anti-feminists, anti-progressives, and pro-capitalists have been shaping their arguments to epically dunk on the left. One of the most logical and factual arguments that they like to use is that of imagined hypocrisy. In this video, entitled Charlie Kirk Exposes Socialist Hypocrisy, Charlie Kirk epically dunks on a socialist college student by pointing out that she drinks coffee at Starbucks. I use Starbucks. Okay. So Starbucks, that's a billionaire. You know how rich Howard Schultz is? He's worth $5 billion. So you're participating in his exploitation. He points out that you can't simultaneously hate billionaires and spend money at their businesses without being a hypocrite. Or as he puts it in his description, if you swish your Starbucks while holding your iPhone and claim to hate billionaires, you're either lying or you just don't know what you're talking about. I'm glad I could talk to you, by the way. Oftentimes these discussions have come so horribly personal. Just last week, I had a conversation with a man who said that all the exploitation in the world was because I made different purchasing decisions. He said that I had to vote with my wallet. If I didn't want to back these coups in third world countries, I'd just buy different brands of stuff. Whenever you try to have a conversation about the failures of a system, people will try to shift the conversation to the choices of individuals. A conversation about the global threat of climate change turns into a conversation about how you should use paper straws instead of plastic ones. A conversation about how our Western society is fundamentally based upon certain ideas about race turns into, well, if only a few actual racists just stop talking about race, racism will all be solved. And of course, who could forget, addressing an economic system built on exploitation and the concentration of power in the hands of a few capital owners turns into, just vote with your wallet. There are, however, a few problems with the idea that capitalism may be great if only we learn to vote better with our wallets. The first problem is that of choice. A lot of times, more ethical products turn out to be more expensive. Turns out that cutting slavery out of your production line means that you actually need to pay more people. Less wealthy people, therefore, often can't afford the more ethical alternatives, and therefore they can't vote with their wallet. Adding to that problem is that if, you, like me, you're a socialist, and you believe that there are some fundamental aspects of capitalism that are unethical, what choice do you really have? Say, for example, that I take issue with the commodification of housing. How am I to vote for that? You see, I can't rent a house at that point because I'd be making someone more wealthy for owning a house, but I can't exactly purchase a home either because at that point I'll be contributing to the commodification of housing. So can I then only complain about the state of the housing market from a park bench? Do I need to be homeless to be able to criticize it? This is the idea that people will talk about when they say there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. We consider certain fundamental aspects of how a capitalist company is run, like surplus labor value extraction, commodification, private ownership, to be unethical. Because of this, no product, no matter how carbon neutral or fair trade the capitalist company produces, can ever truly be ethical to an anti-capitalist. 
At that point, you can't vote with your wallet, unless in the fringe instance that there is actually a worker co-op that sells the products that you want to buy, which there's not that many of, really. The second and probably far greater problem with saying just vote with your wallet is that of responsibility. What you're really saying is that these bad things only happen because consumers allow them to. Child labor, exploitation, and Colombian death squads funded by big businesses to kill union workers is all just one purchasing decision away from being eradicated. What you're doing is you take the responsibility away from the big businesses and putting them on the consumer. You're not holding the multi-billionaire CEOs and shareholders accountable for choosing to use child labor in their production chain. These people have the choice to take these systems out of their production. They can choose tomorrow to stop using slavery or stop using exploitative methods of production, but they don't. You and me, we don't have that choice. Even if we choose to buy a more ethical product, it will still happen. Our contribution is small, and even if we all collectively decided to do it, it will be a slow process before these systems will be eradicated. You're asking consumers to do a lot of research into the products that they buy and where they buy them from, and to make difficult ethical choices, like is it okay to buy a product that maybe isn't produced with slavery from a company that has other products that are produced by slavery? Why do we hold consumers accountable for a choice they don't make? And why don't we hold billionaires accountable for the choices they do make? You know the man I was telling you about? All his arguments seem too familiar to me. And he didn't really seem to have an idea what he was talking about either. I meant to ask him where he got his arguments from, but probably read them in a book somewhere. I don't think it's an entirely coincidence that the conversation about socialism has evolved to such petty, meaningless, surface-level critiques. It could, of course, be a symptom of the fact that conservatives don't understand socialism, that their go-to response is, HA! You claim to not like capitalism, yet you own a iPhone! But I don't think all of them are that dumb. No, don't get me wrong, some of them are actually that dumb. But I find it hard to imagine that conservative thought leaders that have millions of dollars pumped into them by oil billionaires have never even as much as googled the definition of socialism. I'm fully convinced that people like Ben Shapiro know that their rebuttals to socialism and any kind of progressive thought for that matter are absolute nonsense. The truth is that they don't care, or rather they don't have to care. They know that their target audience will gobble it up if they dunk on a leftist for drinking coffee at Starbucks. Their target audience doesn't come there for a genuine conversation about the economic system that we have and who is to benefit from it. It's not about an actual conversation. It's about owning the libs. It's always important to remember that there is a lot of people with a financial incentive to uphold the status quo. A lot of very rich and powerful people have a stake in that the conversation about socialism never reaches the conversation about the actual problems, and that those who hold those conversations are labeled as selfish and lazy hypocrites. I recently got into the stock market, by the way. Better in the hands of a socialist than a capitalist, am I right? We're making a decent set of change too. With the new promotion I got in my job, I've been thinking of buying a new watch for myself. What do you think? I mean, struggling to choose between a Rolex or a Patek Philippe. So what does this all mean for us, lefties? Does the fact that there is no ethical consumption in the capitalism mean we can just buy whatever and that we never have any responsibility over what we buy? Well, it's a difficult conversation because I like stuff, but I do think we have some kind of obligation to at least be conscious of what we buy and what the impact of that is on the world. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have an iPhone or a wardrobe full of clothes, but being conscious of where those clothes come from is a good thing to do. Hell, this isn't even something that just socialists should do. You don't need to be a socialist to recognize the amount of damage that certain industries cause to our environment. Overconsumption is something that is partially responsible for the state that a current climate is in today. And it's something that we need to address. 
Looking critically at our own spending habits won't save the planet, but it does have an impact, however small. Being deliberate with your purchasing decisions is a good thing, not only for the planet, but also for, well, your wallet. Generally, it's gonna be better to buy one good thing than to buy 10 shitty things that break 10 times faster. And I wouldn't necessarily call this an obligation, but it's good practice to at least try to avoid companies that are exceptionally bad. But although we need to be deliberate with our purchasing decisions, it should not and never be where our activism stops. The biggest pitfall of talking about personal responsibility is that we never actually get to talk about the systemic problems at hand. As long as we're talking about plastic versus paper straws, we are not addressing the core issue. And that is that overall, it is the big businesses that cause the most harm to our environment. It's the big corporations that choose to use certain exploitative methods of production, even though they absolutely have the power to do otherwise. We are so preoccupied with talking about an individual spending habits that we don't stop to think, why do we overconsume? Why do we buy the fast fashion? and feel like we need to buy new clothes every month because the fashion has changed. And who benefits from that? Individual action is good, but it won't solve anything. At the end of the day, whether we choose to buy a coffee at Starbucks or in a mom and pop shop, people will still be exploited. The climate will still be under threat and the system will be the same as it was yesterday. But what if we're not talking about coffee? What if we're talking about a Rolls Royce or a mansion? In other words, how rich can a socialist become before it's getting hypocritical? Well, to understand this, we need to know a little bit about a guy called Karl Marx. Marx defined two economic classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The proletariat are the workers, or in other words, they earn money through exchanging their labor for a wage. The bourgeoisie are the owners. They earn their money through owning things. In principle, the bourgeoisie benefits from the system as is and seeks to uphold it, whereas the proletariat is exploited by the current system and at least in principle should be seeking for revolution, although that's not always the case. But there is a little bit more to it than that. As with pretty much anything in this world, it is not a strict binary. And to fully understand where someone falls on the benefits from versus get exploited by spectrum, we need to understand why this distinction is being made. The main differing factor in class isn't, as many people assume, the amount of money that you have but rather it is the relationship that you have to the means of production. In other words, how much skin do you have in the game called capitalism? Let's say, for example, that we have a baker. He owns a small bakery with a few employees. And we have a corporate lawyer. He makes six to seven figures defending multi-billion dollar companies. Now, if we take the previous analysis of class that we used, Technically, the baker is bourgeois because he owns the means of production, he owns his bakery, and the corporate lawyer is the proletariat because he exchanges his labor, being a lawyer, for an hourly wage. But the important question is who is more likely to seek to uphold the system? You see, although the baker would lose his ownership over the bakery if private property is abolished, Given that typically bakers don't make a whole lot of money, materially probably won't change much to his life. Whereas the corporate lawyer, well, he'll probably lose his job, a lot of his money, and pretty much all the power that he had because of that. So although the lawyer is technically a worker and the baker is technically an owner, we can understand that their relationship to the system varies. So what does this all mean? Does it mean that socialists can be rich or not? Well, what it all boils down to is class interests. The class interests of working class are things like affordable healthcare and education and housing and good working conditions. Whereas the class interests of the bourgeoisie are things like cheap labor, a low amount of interference from the government and high corporate power. Oftentimes these class interests are contradictory to one another. 
Good working conditions are expensive and therefore make the labor more expensive. So if someone's class interests align with that of the ruling class, it becomes very unlikely that they will seek to change the status quo. Now, it's not impossible to advocate for change of a system that you are also benefiting of, but it's something to be wary of. If someone claims to support socialism, yet they employ workers and run their company like a traditional capitalist firm, then how principled are they? But even if you don't employ anyone, being rich makes being a socialist more difficult. To really be a socialist, you need to understand and know of the struggles of the working class. If you live in a big mansion in a gated community, the odds that you start to be alienated from the struggles of the working class increases. All in all, I don't think it's impossible or even hypocritical for rich people to join a socialist movement. In fact, I want people like corporate lawyers and people with powerful positions to join our movement. I would much rather have them be a socialist than be a capitalist. But whether you are wealthy or not, we need to be conscious of the effect that our actions have on the world and work both on a small and a large scale to make a better world for everyone. I, for one, am 100% with you. We, workers of the world, need to unite together to fight these capitalists. I've been saying this for years. There is people starving, and we are just... Excuse me. Yes? Who? Right, thank you. What was I talking about? Revolution, right. Do you think we could push it back another week? So, I... I've got a dinner date, I really want to go to. So if you'd excuse me.